Danny Schechter here, your news dissector, editor of MediaChannel.org, introducing a new feature, a series of interviews with people in the independent media, the critical media, the people who are challenging the media narrative. And one of them is Russ Baker. To my left, Russ is a well-known journalist who, who runs a website called Who, What, Why. Uh, he's an analyst uh, and he's a journalist, an investigative journalist. And I wanted to talk with him about what it's like being an investigative journalist, but also also about some of the stories he's breaking, uh, which are very significant when we talk about media in this country, to recognize that there's a kind of media war going on, a cyber war between the forces that want to make information more available, particularly government documents, and the people who don't want that to happen. And this is revolving around the whole question of anonymous and what anonymous is, has been doing. Uh, Russ, you have a piece on, on your website out uh, this week about all this. You want to tell us about it? Sure. Um, we have been following that whole thread in terms of uh, activists who have been seeking to sort of liberate information who think that we need to have a greater understanding of what goes on and how our government functions. Uh, and also about the relationships between the government and the private sector, which I think are not fully understood and certainly are not particularly well covered by the uh, traditional dominant media. So the, the new article is about a, uh, uh, a, a member of the anonymous collective by the name of Barrett Brown, who now faces potential uh, sentences of up to 100 years. Uh, for a variety of charges that are actually individually somewhat trivial and indicative of the determination of both the federal government and a number of powerful corporate interests to shut down this whole movement. In other words, they don't have good, solid, concrete uh, uh, criminal activity, so they go after them for something else. So that's one aspect of you know political repression creeping into if you will, the media space creeping into the online world where we have uh, people who are questioning, challenging, downloading things they're not supposed to be uh, downloading and ending up getting prosecuted or confronted with prosecutions. It's already led to a, a suicide uh, of a, a, a young man in Boston, but it, it's going to be much more of a confrontation in, in the months ahead what with the revelations that China uh, may have a unit that's been, you know, doing cyber crimes against the United States, although that hasn't been proven and China has denied it. Russ, how do you get to this information? How do you find it out? And what is your purpose in, in bringing it out? Uh, I mean, I think the central purpose of who, what, why is to just ask questions. We, we really just want to know. And somebody said to me, my God, you're talking about a sort of a pure journalism play. In other words, we don't feel that we go into these stories with an agenda, but we do want to understand the dynamics. We want to understand why all the players are doing what they're doing. And then once we think we understand it, we want to just come directly out and uh, share our conclusions with the audience because we think that uh, as long as the public is in the dark as to how things operate, things are going to keep getting worse. And we think they are getting worse at a very, very rapid clip. So, I mean, to me, freedom of information and believing in it and, and working to advance it is not an agenda. But leaving that aside, I mean, there is uh, some space now for, for journalists like you, like me, like Media Channel. But that's also at risk in some ways, isn't it? Well, it's in, at risk a lot of different ways. Number one, it's at risk just because for all of us, it's very hard to survive and to function on a practical basis because of the, the monetary issues involved. We uh, have chosen to go the nonprofit route, which means we're entirely dependent on the public getting behind what we do. Tell me about it. No ads. You know about all of that. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is we're, we're potentially at risk because we are trying to be responsible and yet... Uh, not hesitate to share information that we think the public has a right to have. And this puts us potentially in the crosshairs of the same sort of repressive forces. One of the stories you carried recently was sort of made a point, which I think everybody sort of knows, but which was pretty well uh, presented, namely that American media loves to cover freedom struggles in other countries. You know, In other words, dissidents in other countries get a lot of attention in the U.S. press and on television, but dissidents in our country, people with critical viewpoints, with a critique of the media, tend to all be put into a bag, you know, conspiracy nuts and the like, and not treated seriously. 
Right. Well, uh, that particular article on who, what, why began with my looking at a New York Times article sort of celebrating the origins of the uh, uh, uprising in Syria. So the New York Times, even in their news columns, was saying this is a terrific thing, basically. And let's take a look at these young men who got the thing started. And what struck me, Danny, about that particular New York Times article was that it basically talked about how he had uh, scrawled some graffiti, sort of saying, Dr. Assad, you're next. Uh, but but then only way down in the article they buried and uh, mentioned and they said oh he also uh, torched a brand new police kiosk and I was thinking now how would the New York Times react if somebody torched a police kiosk in Times Square and we know how they would react and so there's very much of a double standard trying to kind of shove I mean you could argue that the Syrians went after this guy for the uh, for the uh, uh, vandalism. Uh, the arson potentially uh, and more so than necessarily yeah. the graffiti. Just one thought on Syria that interests me. You know, you have the United States moving towards, you know, rationalizing, justifying, providing arms to the so-called rebels who we don't really know who they are, you know. Uh, at the same time, European countries are saying, whoa, 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 hold off. This might not be a very smart idea. And part of the reason seems to me that a lot of the so-called rebels are actually the jihadis who we condemn in other settings. But somehow if they're attacking a government we don't like, uh, they become freedom fighters. I think what has, is happening in Syria, which also happened uh, uh, in Libya, uh, and I think the same thing to some extent uh, was true of Iraq and is true of Iran is that decisions have been taken that these are regimes that are uh, uh, undesirable as opposed to other authoritarian regimes that are desirable and various factions both within the US government and within the larger Western alliance began moving to sort of foment these things. At On Who, What, Why we have been very aggressively studying and I think you know that on Libya we were practically alone in consistently examining that uprising there to see if it was really authentic or was it very much helped along by the uh, intelligence know, services. I mean isn't that pathetic? Even after our experiences with the Iraq war, we're now commemorating the 10th anniversary now, uh, a war which was characterized by lies and deception. I did a movie, WMD, Weapons of Mass Deception. I wrote two books about it. Many others wrote books about it. Rachel Maddow just did a program about it. We're still... Uh, unmasking the Bush administration, yet the same practices, the same approach uh, seems to have uh, carried on. Oh, that's right, because that's, that's an agenda, and I think this is uh, something very typical of many big countries, and the U.S. is hardly alone, is that when they talk about national security, they're usually talking about uh, uh, financial interests and uh, natural resources, and that's just the constant there. Of course, they can never publicly say, this is why we're going into these places, and so they have to concoct other reasons that sound better and make people feel better. You know, I used the B word before. You didn't really seem to react as much as I thought you might, but I was referring to Mr. Bush. You've written about the Bush uh, family, if you will, a major investigative book. And now we see that younger Bushes, new Bushes, are coming out of the Bushes, uh, you, you know, kind of uh, nephews and, and others, a new generation of Bushes. Who's behind them and, and what's going on here? Well, as you know, thank you for mentioning my book, Family of Secrets. I spent five years on that, trying to understand why somebody as improbable as George W. Bush would get to the top, have all of those powerful people behind him, and then do the astonishing things that he did. And it really, that was a, a journey of discovery for me, Danny. I learned so many things that astounded me and, and helped bring me to a deeper level of comprehension of the American power structure. And so the Bush family very much have taken it upon themselves themselves to have this particular role to sort of be the uh, counterpart, let's say, to the Kennedy dynasty, but sort of on the other side, and that they will be the ones, generation after generation, looking after the interests uh, of the plutocracy. So, so do you think Jeb is coming back, and, and what about... Uh this young, younger Bush. Yeah, I think Jeb is very much a contender. Uh, then the George P. Bush, you're talking about uh, his son. And I think there are others in the family who are also being groomed. They're, they're imagining, uh, I, I, I guess, a, a century, a golden century uh, under their okay. influence. Let me, let me just uh, close up with your, some concluding thoughts from you about the importance and the value of the work you do. I know it's frustrating sometimes. We don't get generate the money we need. We don't get the attention often we deserve, but we carry on 
I know I do because of a belief in the importance of it, and you must as well. And, and so how do people reach you, and, and how do you think this whole new independent media uh, movement is going to move on? And, and what, what, any thoughts about our new media channel? Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very optimistic because I think that uh, the, 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 your new ventures, your continued ventures, those of others, are all extremely important. And I think that as long as we're able to keep the tubes open uh, of the Internet and that is not overly controlled, we have an opportunity to get our voices out there. I would certainly, personally, as far as who, what, why goes, we are growing steadily. Our stories are being picked up by a, a wider range of, of other outlets. Uh, and we're seeing the public responding. Um, so I'm very, very hopeful. I'm excited. And I think the next year is going to be, uh, be an important time. I, we, the people can reach us uh, via our website, whowhatwhy.org. Uh, and also we're on Twitter, at whowhatwhy. And that's Russ Baker, uh, editor, writer, investigative reporter, and a very gutsy uh, journalist who's out there trying to get at the truth that's often buried. We've featured him uh, on Media Channel in print, but now we're going to feature him and others to come in interviews like this. We'd like to get your reaction to this idea of actually showing you and introducing some of the journalists who are on the cutting edge of independent and investigative journalism. We're starting with Russ Baker. We'll carry on with others. You can share your comments with me at Dissector at MediaChannel.org. I'm Danny Schechter, your News Dissector. Thanks for watching.